In A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens' classic novel about the French Revolution, the author looks at the impact of her revolution in political thought on London and Paris. Those cities are separated by the English Channel and national borders. The two towns I want to talk about are separated only by time and a revolution in philosophy. Holliston in 1750 is an isolated backwater. It has more in common with the 17th century than the 18th century of the Enlightenment. The British subjects living here are struggling to survive on the frontier. And from our perspective, they appear hung up on religion. By 1850, better communications with the outside world have brought Holliston more in step with the rest of the world. This isn't about death and dying, or about putting people on the ground and digging them up, but we will touch on those topics. Rather, this is a program about a revolution in thought that swept America during the 19th century. And since the movement originated here in Massachusetts, we can see a record of the conflict here in Holliston. We need look no further than Central Burying Ground in the center of Holliston and nearby Lake Grove Cemetery on the western shore of Lake Winthrop. Central Burying Ground, listen to the words, Central Burying Ground. It's an orderly storage area conveniently close by the town's meeting house. Here, our forefathers placed the bodies of the faithful while they waited for Gabriel's trumpet to sound the last judgment. The stones here speak of death and of lives that were frequently very brief. It was publicly owned. Everyone buried here was nominally a Puritan. It was centrally located. It was managed by deacons and sextons. And they were individual graves. But the thing that strikes us most, about the early graves at least, are the winged death's heads, which we'll talk about in a moment. Lake Grove Cemetery. What does that name tell us? The words, Lake Grove, call up images of a pleasant destination, a cool picnic ground under the trees. Cemetery is borrowed from the French, cimetière, from the Greek word for sleeping place. By 1860, when Lake Grove Cemetery was open, a revolution in thought had taken place. Gone is the bleak Calvinist belief in predestination, the notion that most mortals were destined for eternal hellfire, and only a few saints, the elect of God, would be saved. At Lake Grove Cemetery, the dead are now sleeping peacefully while they wait for the final trumpet. Lake Grove Cemetery is privately owned, it's non-denominational, it's in an outlying location, is managed by a board of trustees, and there are bounded family plots rather than individual graves. The symbolism that we see there, flowers and lambs, is strikingly different. What happened? Why is Lake Grove Cemetery so different? Four main reasons come to mind, though you could certainly name other contributing factors. The Great Awakening, the collapse of the Puritan theocracy, Unitarianism and Transcendentalism, and the rural cemetery movement itself. In order to understand why the two cemeteries are so different in appearance, you first have to understand the world that produced the Central Burying Ground, a world very different from the one we know today. It was a world influenced by Calvinism and the Puritan movement in England after the Reformation. First, a word about Calvinism, and we'll keep this short. John Calvin was a Frenchman of relatively humble birth who studied at the same college in Paris as Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. But unlike Loyola, Calvin never took holy orders and eventually he married. He sought to reform or purify the church, not to overthrow it. He built his theology on the works of St. Augustine and the other church fathers. He eventually moved to Switzerland 
since a lot of people with ideas much like his ended up being burned at the stake. In Geneva, he advocated universal education, and he himself studied the Bible in the original Greek and Hebrew texts. In 1541, he published his short treatise on the Lord's Supper and the form of prayer and manner of ministering the sacraments according to the use of the ancient church. And that's an interesting point. He was very much interested in getting back to the church as Jesus would have known it. So therefore, you see a lot of emphasis in Calvinism on ancient Hebrew practices. What is predestination? It's the idea that most of sinful mankind is doomed for eternal hellfire, and only a few elect, the saints, have been chosen or elected by God for salvation. What's a little hard for us to understand is that this is not based on good works or the virtue with which you lived your life. If you were one of the elect, yes, you lived your life virtuously, but so did everybody else. However, the elect had a sense of being of the elect, of being chosen. They prospered in this world, and their very prospering was seen as evidence that they were of the elect. Who were the Puritans? After Henry VIII broke away from the Church of Rome, there grew up a body of believers in England who called themselves Puritans. They wanted to reform and purify the Anglican Church. The Puritans came to Massachusetts Bay to found a theocracy, government by the rule of God. As in England, there was no separation of church and state here in Massachusetts Bay. Just as the king was the defender of the faith, the civil magistrates here in the Bay Colony supported the pastor and the council of elders. In towns like Holston, the same individuals often filled the parallel functions. That is, deacons acted as magistrates. The tithing man was responsible for collecting God's tenth portion, but he also was responsible for collecting taxes in general. He was the tax collector and the constable. Calvin advocated stripping away all the pomp and trappings of feudalism to return to worship based on the Jewish concept of congregations. In practice, congregationalism led to democracy. This is Rocky Hill Meeting House. It's by far the best preserved example of an original 18th century meeting house interior in New England. It was built in 1785, so it's quite a bit later than the Holliston Meeting House. But since nearly all meeting houses were built to the same design, this is probably very much the way Holliston's first meeting house looked. Religious services were held here on the Sabbath and the town's business was conducted here. At meetings, it was not always clear when the assembled were rendering unto Caesar and when they were rendering unto God. If you thought big hair originated in the 60s, think again. Cotmath was a third generation of Puritan divines here in the Bay Colony. Both his father and his grandfather were ministers. Both of them were very influential. Cotton Mather, in The Soul Upon the Wing, wrote, At death we are passing into an invisible world. What then becomes of us? We then fly away to another world. This expression, we fly away, it seems an allusion to the condition of a bird, which has been hatching its full time. When the time for it arrives, the shell breaks, and the bird then does fly away. Our death is the breaking of the shell and we have an immortal spirit in us, and in this we fly away. This is a sermon delivered in Boston in 1723. Let's look at death's heads that we see in Central Burying Ground and the symbology of the death's head. To us, they look strange, but if you look closely, they're really not quite so strange as they seem, and bear in mind, the illusion that Cotton Mather makes to our death being the breaking of the shell that allows our spirit to fly away. The skull represents the dead person's immortal spirit. The wings show that spirit in transition 
and the curved top of the headstone represents an archway between this world and the next, the entrance to heaven, if you will. And when you look closely, you'll see virtually all 18th century gravestones have that arched top to them. Note the softening of the symbology that takes place over time. Here we see the death's head from Mary Prentice's gravestone of 1759. It's a very conventional winged skull, but look what happens over time. Here's the 1770 gravestone of James Whitney, and notice that it looks like a portrait of James Whitney himself. It's a so-called soul effigy. 18 years later, we see the gravestone of the Reverend Joshua Prentice. And note, this is a winged cherub that's replaced the skull that we saw on Joshua Prentice's wife's gravestone back in 1759. In 29 years, we see the complete evolution from a winged death's head to a winged cherub. Most of the later stones in Central Burying Ground are of the weeping willow, the so-called tree of life. This reflects increased classicism that we see late in the 18th century and the early 19th century. People by then were uncomfortable with the idea of winged death's heads, and many of these people were, in fact, Unitarians because there was a hot Unitarian movement going on here in Massachusetts. terminology has changed. First of all, the word hearse. We think of a wagon or an automobile for taking the coffin to the cemetery. But originally it wasn't a wagon, but a set of trestles that the bearers could set the coffin down upon to get it up on their shoulders. And if it were a long way to the cemetery, sometimes there would be trestles set up along the way or a hearse set up along the way so that the underbearers carrying the coffin could stop and rest. The eight men carrying the coffin are properly called underbearers, strong young men capable of carrying a full coffin to the graveyard. In the 18th century, coffins were usually simple pine boxes, unfinished. To hide the raw wood, it was normally covered with a pall, a plain black cloth, which usually belonged to the town. Four or more honorary pallbearers held the corners or edges of the pall. Since they were selected for the dignity that they brought to the procession, they were likely to be elderly or infirm and not capable of carrying a full coffin. So, why are the cemeteries so different? Well, first, I want to look at a phenomenon called the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening originated in large part because there was a shortage of trained ministers. It began in the frontier settlements. It was an evangelical feel-good religion for the common man. This emotionalism prepared the way for the Universalists, the Methodists, and the Baptists, denominations that spoke to the heart rather than to the intellect, and it swept away the Puritan notion of predestination. Calvinism was too cerebral and morally demanding for the common man. In 1740 and 1741 came the Great Awakening, an evangelical spiritual awakening kindled by the preaching of Gilbert Tennant and George Whitefield. It spread through the colonies, inspiring many lay men to preach the word, despite a lack of education. Jonathan Edwards was a pastor out in Northampton, Massachusetts, in the Connecticut Valley. In 1741, he was at the height of his powers. Personally, he was much more concerned with the intellectual fine points of Calvinist doctrine. But in 1741, he preached a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and the symbology is wonderful. God holds you over the pit of hell, much as one might hold a spider over the fire on the hearth. O oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder.
Thus it will be with you that are in an unconverted state. The collapse of the Puritan theocracy. Remember I said that a theocracy was governance by the rule of God. One of the reasons why the Puritans lost their stranglehold on religion in the Bay Colony is that over time, competition developed. John Wesley and his brother Charles showed worshipers that religion could be emotionally rewarding. They taught Protestants how to sing, not lining out psalms in unison, but glorious four-part singing and the hymns were moving and relevant. And the newcomers were not averse to a few creature comforts while they worshiped. They had stoves and organs and even multi-part choirs. The Methodists quipped, more souls have been brought to heaven by singing than by preaching. Now the Congregationalists weren't the only game in town. Remember I mentioned the tithing man. He was the collector of taxes. And those taxes went to support a minister. They paid the minister's salary. Just as in the Church of England, the minister was on the state payroll. From the beginning of the colony, the church had elected the minister and the town approved the choice. It was a rubber stamp kind of thing, since the same men were deacons in the church often and selectmen of the town. In 1818, the selectmen, or the parish of Dedham, chose Unitarian Reverend Alvin Lamson as minister, and this despite the fact that a majority of the congregation were Trinitarians. Calvinists were Trinitarians. They believed in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Trinitarians left the church and sued. The selectmen appealed to the Supreme Judicial Court to confirm their choice of minister. In his 1820 ruling, Chief Justice Parker wrote, Whatever the usage in settling ministers, the Bill of Rights of 1780 secures to towns, not to churches, the right to elect the minister where a majority of the members of a congregational church separate from the majority of the parish, the members who remain, although a minority, constitute the church in such parish and retain the rights and property belonging thereto. In 1850, the courts ruled churches could manage their own affairs. The Dedham decisions of 1820, 1831, and 1850 demonstrated that state support was a two-edged sword. There were advantages to separating the church and state. Many churches decided to incorporate and draw up bylaws. In time, the established Puritan church came to think of itself as a denomination, the Congregational Church, and as one among many. It had to compete in comforts and relevance with rival denominations that now began to spring up. It wasn't until 1865 at the Burial Hill Conference in Plymouth that Congregationalists distanced themselves from Calvinism and predestination. With the building of a new town hall in 1855, Holliston completed disestablishment. The new building replaced an earlier townhouse that stood on the same site. In one sense, disestablishment is not complete even today. Although the Congregational Church sold to the town the land on which the town hall sits a few years ago, it was with the proviso that should the current use ever change, the land reverts to the church. The third factor that influenced the look of Lake Grove Cemetery was Unitarianism and Transcendentalism. Orthodox Congregationalists believe in the Trinity, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Unitarianism grew out of Congregationalism. It reflected the innovative spirit of Federalism, 
Unitarians denied the divinity of Jesus of Nazareth while clinging to his teachings. Unitarians such as Ralph Waldo Emerson and Theodore Parker rejected the supernatural in religion. Their humanistic view of the world was based on science and Eastern religions. They saw nature as infused with the spirit of divinity. Where Unitarians were in a majority, as in Sherburn, they got to keep the church structure and the name First Parish. In conservative towns such as Holliston, the Unitarians felt compelled to leave and build elsewhere, often on the other side of the town green. In 1836, in Holliston, the Unitarian minority moved across the street to a building that was in what is now the parking lot of St. Mary's Church. The bit of information I found most startling was that while one-third of Massachusetts churches voted to go Unitarian, in Boston, 12 of 14 churches in Boston chose to go Unitarian. The Romantic movement affected ideas about the nature of death and man's place in nature. The New England Transcendentalist movement flowered in Middlesex County. Ralph Waldo Emerson dusted off the metaphysics of Plato and Kant and Plato's ideals of beauty, truth, and goodness, the idea that these ideals are reflections of divinity. In the transcendent moment when we are moved by great beauty, we glimpse the face of God. In the 1830s and 50s, Concord's Amos Bronson Alcott, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau were at the forefront of social change, advocating abolition of slavery, communitarian experiments such as Fruitlands and Brook Farm, and educational innovation. The fourth factor that makes Lake Grove Cemetery look so different from Central Burying Ground is the rural cemetery movement itself. But to understand it, we have to back up for a moment and look at conditions in Europe at the start of the 19th century, where the rural cemetery movement began. In Europe, graveyards associated with ancient churches had been in use for many hundreds of years, even thousands of years in the case of ancient cities such as Paris. Bodies were buried much as here, but when enough years had passed that only bones would remain, the same grave was reused. Any bones that were found were pushed aside or removed to an ossuary or charnel house. Bodies of the poor were buried in communal pits and covered with quicklime to hasten decomposition. After the passage of some years, the pits were emptied, the bones removed to a charnel house, as seen here, and the pit reused for new burials. In 1780, in Paris, there was a scandal. Holy Innocence Cemetery in Paris held the bones and bodies of Parisians from 30 generations. In 1780, the wall of a pit containing hundreds of bodies collapsed into the cellars of adjoining dwellings. It was a section of wall 15 meters long and two stories high. There was an unholy mess. The old regime was impotent to deal with the problem. The stench from charnel houses and potter's fields and burial pits in the center of cities was intolerable. But even in places like Boston and New York, the public questioned the wisdom of digging in densely packed churchyards to squeeze in the newly dead next to the recently dead. The crisis came to a head in 1804, it's the same year that Napoleon crowned himself emperor of the French. He solved the problem with characteristic decision and elegance. He stopped burials within Paris by fiat, and he found new burial spaces on the edges of the city. In a public relations coup, he called them cimetières, or sleeping places. During Napoleon's reign, the French removed the bodies and bones of six million dead people from Paris and transformed Holy Innocence into Les Salles Marketplace. 
Father Lachaise was the confessor to Louis XIV. His estate on the outskirts of Paris became a monastery for elderly Jesuits. And after the revolution, it was seized by the Republic and the buildings pulled down. Because it was attractively landscaped and near the city, it made an ideal cemetery site. Here's a picture, a contemporary painting from Le Cimetière du Père Lachaise in Paris. It's well outside the city in 1806, as you can see from the painting. You can see Paris gleaming in the distance. But there was a problem. No one wanted to be buried way out in the boonies. So again, Napoleon had the perfect answer. He just directed that managers of the cemetery dig up famous people and move them to Le Cimetière du Père Lachaise. So they dug up Abelard and Eloise, who you may remember from the Middle Ages. I remember that Abelard met with an unfortunate accident. And the fabulist La Fontaine and the playwright Moliere. And suddenly, with these upscale neighbors to be buried next to, Le Cimetière du Père Lachaise was a big hit. And Père Lachaise was the model for the Royal Cemetery Movement in the United States. Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts was the first rural cemetery in the United States, and it was modeled after Père Lachaise in Paris. In contrast to the level and adorned sites of traditional graveyards, the location chosen for Mount Auburn was highly varied, consisting of hills and dales, punctuated by ponds, lawns, and orchards, and traversed by winding paths. The site was also heavily wooded, and for the most part, in its natural state. Writers like Andrew Jackson Downing saw garden cemeteries as a sanctuary from the city and associated them with romantic notions of the sanctity of nature. Cemeteries were viewed as a place of escape from the noise, dirt, and confusion of the city. Why do Egyptian motifs show up at Père Lachaise, Mount Auburn, and the other garden cemeteries? Lake Grove has lots of obelisks, and some even showed up at Central Burying Ground in the last years before the town stopped using it. In 1798, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, he took along with him a 21-year-old classical scholar and archaeologist named Jean-Jacques Champollion. French soldiers brought to Champollion a stone they found in a Nile Delta village the French called Rosette. The stone had the same text in three languages, hieroglyphics, Demotic, a later form of Egyptian, and Greek. In 1822, Jean-Jacques' younger brother, Jean-Francois, used the Rosetta stone to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics, the meaning of which had been lost. The work of the Champollion brothers led to a fascination with Egyptian ideas of afterlife. Translation of Egyptian hieroglyphs suggested that many Christian beliefs, such as judgment of the soul and even burial practices, had Egyptian origin. Interest in Egyptology helped spark the Egyptian revival movement during the period 1820-1850, affecting mainly art and architecture. In 1836, a giant obelisk from the temple at Luxor was set up in Paris at the Place de la Concorde. Egyptian obelisks were shipped to London and New York. By the 1860s, sphinxes and obelisks were guarding the graves of America's garden cemeteries. Another nearby cemetery of the rural cemetery movement that was very influential was Forest Hills in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Whereas Mount Auburn was a private cemetery, Forest Hills is a public cemetery run originally by the town of Roxbury, although it's now private. In it, we see some glorious sculptural monuments. This much-copied Civil War monument to the Union dead was sculpted by 24-year-old Martin Milmore. Martin and his brother Joseph were both stonecutters, and Martin went on into sculpture. The reason the statue of a Union sentry is so familiar is that the foundry that cast it made little replicas which were widely distributed and became the models for similar monuments around the country. 
Unfortunately, Martin Milmore was an alcoholic and he died of cirrhosis at age 38. Daniel Chester French, a fellow sculptor, immortalized him with this wonderful statue from Forest Hills called Death Staying the Hand of the Sculptor. It's like nothing I've ever seen. There's two life-size figures of the sculptor, Mark Milmore, and Death dressed up for a party. Also at Forest Hills are several other Daniel Chester French monuments, including this famous angel from the White Monument. Rural cemeteries sprung up all over. An author promoting Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, one of the many designed after the model of Mount Auburn, writes, you are now in a vestibule of nature's own making. Its floor is a delicious greensward, its walls are the steep hillside. Lofty trees with their leafy capitals form its colonnade, and its ceiling is the azure vault. Here, if alive to gentle influences, you will pause a moment. You will shake from your feet the city's dust and leave behind you its cares and follies. You are within the precinct of a great primeval temple, now forever set apart to pious uses. Massachusetts formed a cemetery commission that promoted the building of new rural cemeteries. In Framingham, Edgell Grove Cemetery was opened in 1849. And in 1859, a meeting of friends of a new cemetery was called here in Holliston. And when it came, it came fast. On September 9th, 1859, friends of the idea met to hear a report of the commissioners from the state. They elected a committee to consider sites. Ten days later, they voted to issue 80 shares at $25 each. And remember, $25 was a lot back then. On October 18th, they organized under a board of trustees. On November 5th, they voted to accept a detailed constitution, apparently borrowed from Edgell Grove. And on November 7th, they approved the name Lake Grove Cemetery unanimously. The list of 49 original subscribers is a veritable who's who of Halston's 3,100 residents. If you were anybody and you had $25, you bought a share in the new cemetery. As at Mount Auburn, Forest Hills, and elsewhere, the cemetery was laid out with lots sited along named avenues and paths. The paths were usually named after the local plants, reflecting the sponsorship of the Massachusetts Horticultural Cultural Society at Mount Auburn. Along about the time that Lake Grove Cemetery was set up, there was a major change in how people were buried. I believe it probably was a result of the American Civil War. The American Civil War gave many people their first exposure to the idea of embalming. Embalming is replacing the blood in a, in a newly dead person with formaldehyde to retard spoilage. Embalming made it possible to ship Union soldiers home for burial. Thousands of bodies were so treated, usually in tents or makeshift structures such as this old barn shown in the Matthew Brady photograph taken near Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1862. Embalming was a technology beyond the skill of the local village carpenter who previously had supplied coffins for grieving families. This led entrepreneurs to set up in business as undertakers. For a fee, they would undertake the task of arranging for burial. Another phenomenon we find strange at Lake Grove Cemetery is that people dug up long buried family members. This is because at Lake Grove, we have family burying plots, and the idea of gathering in all your children was a very popular one. James and Nancy Cutler, who I happen to know because I now live in their house, bought a plot at Lake Grove Cemetery. In 1859, four of their children had already predeceased them and had been buried in Central Burying Ground. James and Nancy had their four children dug up and reburied in the new family plot at Lake Grove Cemetery. 
and this wasn't an unusual occurrence. When I first proposed this talk to the Holliston Historical Society, I built it as a pictorial romp through Lake Grove Cemetery. So now I'm going to show you a few aspects of Lake Grove that clearly show it was influenced by the rural cemetery movement. First, we can see the evidence of landscaping. One of the first things that the trustees did was hire an ox team to move the glacial till around to create terraces where bodies could be buried. I mentioned that there were Egyptian Revival influences at Lake Grove Cemetery. The Egyptian Revival style reflects the influence of Napoleon's 1798 Egyptian campaign. If you look, you'll see many obelisks at Lake Grove Cemetery. If you've seen Napoleon's tomb at Les Invalides, this stone may look familiar. It's a somewhat smaller version of Napoleon's tomb. Many other grander cemeteries of the rural cemetery movement actually have freestanding tombs. We have a receiving tomb at Lake Grove Cemetery, but aside from this stone, which looks very much like a tomb, we don't actually have any tombs at Lake Grove. We do have a few statues, the most striking of which is this one from the Leland family plot. The feeling was that public works of art ennobled the spirit and art transformed the graveyard into a public park and Lake Grove became a Sunday destination. At Lake Grove, you had bounded family plots. Privileges were secured to cemetery lot purchases by deed. Lot owners had the right to erect monuments, cenotaphs, or stones commemorative of the dead, or to cultivate trees, shrubs, or plants and they were encouraged to erect suitable landmarks of stone or iron at the corners of the lots. The trustees later backed away from this policy of erecting fences because of the difficulties it created in mowing. We're indebted to the Odd Fellows Trust for rebuilding the warming hut on the grounds of Lake Grove Cemetery. At Lake Grove Cemetery, we see stones in a wide variety of styles. My favorite is this 1878 monument to Elizabeth Kett. It's unusual in that it appears to be a likeness of Elizabeth Kett. I don't know much about her. Elizabeth M. Kett was born in 1819 and died in 1892. At our house, we always refer to her as Maud Frickett because she looks like the Jonathan Winters characters to whom she bears an uncanny resemblance. And I'm not sure yet if this unusual portrait from life was done in 1878, but it was sometime thereabouts. Evidence suggests that John W. Kett commissioned the stone by the time his father died, when Elizabeth was 58. Certainly it was done before 1890 when he died, and it's not of his mother because she died later. I've never seen a monument even vaguely like it. It's remarkable. This stone shows the gates of heaven opening to accept the departed. Lake Grove Cemetery has named avenues and paths. This one takes us back towards the exit and the Henry Cutler Memorial Exit Road. In the Holliston, mirrored by Central Burying Ground, we see Europeans living on an unforgiving frontier, clinging to a difficult Calvinist faith. In the Holliston of Lake Grove Cemetery, we see mirrored the hope and optimism that 19th century America held up to Europe and the world. But the constant that we see reflected back from both cemeteries is the abiding love with which families sustain one another in the face of death. In his first letter to the church members at Corinth, St. Paul wrote, Bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, 
But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see as through a glass, darkly, but then shall we see face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully, even as I am known. So faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you.